Well, uh, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, certainly for me it's a real pleasure to be here in, in Thailand. Uh, in general, to be here in Asia, I haven't been here for the last uh, two and a half to three years. So it's a real pleasure to be back and uh, definitely it's a real pleasure to have this taste of normality and hopefully this will uh, continue uh, for year, years to come. As uh, very appropriately Seth put, uh, put it in his introductory remarks for us uh, central bankers, uh, it has been a very interesting period challenging period, and uh, in a way, the type of period that uh, we, we hope will not arrive, uh, but at the same time, uh, when it arrives, it shows the great benefits that Central Bank can bring to society. And uh, precisely that's what we will discuss today uh, in different ways of forms, uh, in this very, very initial a very initial uh, panel will discuss issues related to dynamics of growth and inflation, which are very, very, very broad terms. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, that's what the uh, people really care the most about. Uh, how much are they going to pay for, for their sustenance? Uh, how, how is their well-being? And that's directly uh, related to uh, growth and, and inflation. Now, it, it, it definitely, before we go into the substance, I want to, to again uh, thank uh, Seth Aput for, for having put this together, for inviting us to co-chair this event uh, with Bank of Thailand. It's a real pleasure to, to do that. Bank of Thailand has been a very strong partner of the BIS for the last at least two decades. and. Uh, we not only uh, cherish a lot this uh, the partnership we have had, but in the international community, the contribution of Bank of Thailand has been very important, and we're, we're very happy to have been invited to this uh, birthday party, as, as you put it. Uh, just uh, for, for procedure, uh, I understand that this uh, session is on the record and will be uh, live streamed. Uh, we have a, a stellar group, group of panelists. You, you know all of them. Uh, it's particularly great to have here uh, Christine Lagarde that came uh, for, from very far away and just arrived this morning. <laughs> so it's a it's double privilege to have her here here today. Uh, so before, before I, I start giving the floor to, to the panelists, let, let me just compliment a little bit of what uh, Seth Aput said in his, uh, in his uh, introductory uh, remarks. And let me have, take the liberty to share some thoughts on the topic to help uh, set the stage. Uh, well, needless to say, uh, the return of inflation has been the defining economic event uh, this year. Uh, at the same time, this has bring uh, central bank reactions. This has bring reactions of society. Uh, and so we see now very different issues that characterize the economic environment. Rapid rising interest rates, uh, tightening financial conditions, sharp asset price falls, uh, financial market disruptions, even a meltdown in the crypto markets and the material slowdown in global uh, growth prospects. Uh, but at the end of the day, all this can be tracked down to higher inflation. Therefore, uh, this is definitely the, 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 the key assignment for all of us, and it's how to bring inflation down. Now, one, one aspect that is particularly important at this stage to realize, and I think this is different to other inflationary episodes, and that is, that, is that, the, that this higher inflation is essentially a global phenomenon. We have had in, in our own countries uh, our different episodes of inflation. We have managed to tackle those episodes, uh, but we have, uh, I would say, never faced 
a, a such an important a increase in global inflation. The simultaneity of it is quite remarkable. Uh, I would say that uh, over 90% of advanced economies have an inflation rate above 5% and pretty much the same percentage as emerging market economies. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that is quite, quite notorious. Uh, at the same time, uh, there are very important differences uh, regionally, and uh, I think the richness of our panel here today will help us uh, probably dwell deeper on the, uh, on the different uh, inflationary aspects uh, regionally. Uh, to start with, uh, Europe is experiencing a very high inflation rate, running now at 10%. Mm -hmm. uh, very good news this week. <laughs> Hopefully, they will continue. Uh, but I, I would say a salient issue is that high energy prices have been particularly acute in Europe, contributing more to inflation there than in other regions. In the US, inflation is high, but not as high, uh, around uh, 8%. Their energy and food prices have been less important, and I would say the contribution of rising services prices, particularly for housing-related items, have been uh, larger, and there clearly the aspect of aggregate demand uh, stimuli uh, associated with COVID has been playing a very important role, both monetarily and uh, fiscally. In the region I come from, Latin America, uh, we also have been having, having quite in, uh, high inflation rates, but uh, not that different from advanced economies, and that is also a, a quite unique uh, circumstance. Uh, I would say the experience that Latin America has had has been very important and has allowed us a prompt reaction and uh, bring inflation threats under control. And then we can come here to, to Asia, where also uh, the story is quite varied. The two regional uh, largest economies, uh, China and uh, Japan, uh, underlying inflation is, has, is higher than usual, but it still remains quite low. And elsewhere in Asia, headline inflation sits in a narrow range between 5 and 8%. Uh, so I think it would be very important to highlight what are the, what are the differences, but it's at the same time how the collective reaction to, to this global inflation uh, will help in the process of bringing inflation under control. And there are other aspects that also needs to be, need to be highlighted in this process mm -hmm. of a simultaneous tightening, which is the spillover effects and uh, the challenges that might bring in, in financial markets, namely how capital flows and exchange rates will adjust and what are the financial stability risks. <laughs> now, unavoidably, uh, the tightening of monetary conditions will bring a lower economic, uh, economic growth. Um, now, obviously, this will manifest itself in different, in, in different ways. Uh, it, it is always an uncomfortable topic for central banks to talk about growth because we really mind it, we really care about it, but at the same time, we, ha we don't have much control about it, and oftentimes our, our, our actions are being uh, evaluated based on the impact of our actions in economic growth. Uh, in some cases, there is a dual mandate, uh, but that is not that common. Uh, it will be interesting to hear from the panel panels uh, how do we see the economic growth dynamics today. Uh, I mean, w at the same time, we have come, we are coming from a period where, for at least close to 10, 15 years, growth has has been a lot dependent on fiscal and monetary policy actions. In a way, we're sort of at the end of the road in the capacity of fiscal and monetary policy to keep having an impact on growth. And now we have to go back and reassess uh, what really growth uh, uh, is determined by. And that brings us to structural issues, as Seta put, put it. So it will be interesting to hear from this. Uh, 
in any case, I, I have the strong belief that the best that central banks can do uh, uh, is to have to, to assure a necessary condition, although not sufficient condition for growth, and is to have inflation low and stable. Uh, it's easy said, but it's different, di difficult to achieve, and well, precisely we are in this in this process. So, with these introductory remarks, let me now jump uh, directly into our panel. Uh, we will this the, the panelist members uh, were in a way chosen so that we can have a, a, a close to a global global view. And uh, we, we will start uh, hearing from Ji Gang, a corner of the People's Bank of China. China is very important in Asia, so and for the global economy, so it will be interesting to hear from him. Uh, regretfully, he could not join us uh, today. But then we'll pivot to Europe, and we'll have Christine give us uh, her views on what is going on in Europe. So this will be two relatively lengthy uh, interventions, and then I'll give the floor both to uh, Perry uh, from Bank of Indonesia and to Phil Lowe, and uh, Raghur Rajan will join us uh, virtually. I will ask them to make some introductory remarks, and then I will uh, bombard them with a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> and after the dialogue we, we will have among ourselves, uh, I will open the floor uh, to all of you. So without further ado, let me now invite uh, Yi Gang's uh, intervention. Distinguished Governor Setaput Sutiva Narupu, General Manager Augustine Customs, President Christine Lagarde, Governor Philip Lowe, Governor Perry Vadrio, Professor Raghu Rajan, good morning. On behalf of the People's Bank of China, I would like to extend my sincere congratulations to the Bank of Thailand on its 80th anniversary. It gives me great pleasure to speak at this conference. I would like to take this opportunity to say something about growth and inflation. I recall that about one or two years ago, we were still debating whether the inflationary pressure was transitory or entrenched. Since the beginning of this year, however, most advanced economies started tightening monetary policies. Many central banks are hiking interest rate aggressively at a much faster pace than previous tightening cycles. And also, many emerging market and low-income countries have seen pressures of local currency depreciation, capital outflows, and inflation at the same time. Meanwhile, indicators such as mortgage rates and PMIs throughout the world show that the likelihood of a slowdown or a recession sometimes next year is on the rise. Central banks are faced with a delicate balancing act of fighting inflation and keeping the economy growing at the same time. As for China, our consumer price index right now is about 2%. This is particular due to a bumper harvest in grain and stable energy prices. Our gas and oil prices follow global trends, but our coal price is just one half of the international level. Our electricity prices have basically been stable since the beginning of this year. Looking for next year, the inflation forecast for China is in the moderate range. China's growth rate, however, right now is somewhat slower than expected 
due to COVID and other factors. Our third quarter growth rate is 3.9% on a year-on-year -year basis, but as you see, we have a pretty accommodative monetary policy in place to help with economic recovery and maximize employment. And our focus is growth right now. We recently cut the required reserve ratio by 25 basis points and also let the market interest rates lower a little bit. On top of its aggregate dimension, our monetary policy also has a structural side that is providing much needed support to agriculture, small and medium enterprises, private companies, and the green finance. Looking forward, faced with a challenging situation, the advanced economies and emerging market economies need better collaboration on macroeconomic policies. That is why the theme of this session, growth and uh, inflation dynamics, is so important. I hope the productive discussion here today will give us uh, some clues to jointly tackle the difficult problems we all have on hand. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yi Gang. Uh, very, very interesting uh, points. Now let's, let's go directly to uh, Europe and let me invite uh, Christine uh, to share with us uh, your views on this uh, very uh, important challenge uh, we are all facing together. Please, Christine. Well, thank you so much, uh, Augustine, and uh, thank you to the Bank of Thailand and to the BIS for having organized uh, such an anniversary. 80 years of age is pretty impressive, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted, actually, to, to be with you, to be here physically, and uh, to have a chance to discuss with many of the colleagues, governors, and other regulators from this part of the world, because I think that we have a lot to learn from each other and uh, a lot of the new concepts and new principles actually originated uh, from, uh, from this part of the world. Inflation targeting was something that uh, not many people knew until and unless it came out of, what was it? New Zealand, yes. wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Governor of New Zealand is with us. Wonderful. So, um, from my corner of the world, which is uh, Europe, but more specifically the Euro area, what I would like to do in, in those few minutes that I was given to uh, introduce, and while paying tribute to how you set the scene, both of you, because you really covered a lot of ground, I would like to tell you the story of three uncertainties, two interactions, one monetary policy. So three, two, one. Mm. And I'll start with the uncertainties uh, that dwell a little bit on, on what um, was mentioned in the, uh, in the introduction. We are going through a very, very challenging time where ground is shifting under our feet and where monetary policy is complicated by at least those three uncertainties, but I'm going to pick those three uh, by priority. The first uh, is the uncertainty about the short-term outlook. Since the global economy is being hit by a series of very strong supply shocks that are pushing inflation and growth in two opposite directions. This is visible in the global economy when I will call this group of countries affected by inflation the OECD countries. Uh, because numbers were released very recently. So OECD inflation reached 10.7% in October, of which 45% was food and energy. You'll understand why I mentioned specifically that. The Global Composite Output PMI Index deteriorated further in October 
with both services and manufacturing falling further below the 50 threshold. And the number that was released this morning goes exactly in the same direction, declining yet again. Well, if you thought that that was bad, uh, it's somehow worse uh, in Europe. So in Europe, inflation, as you indicated, Augustine, was uh, very slightly down. And we're talking about headline here. Uh, but is currently the latest reading for November was uh, 10%, of which, and that's a number that really matters a lot, 70% was food and energy, as compared with the 45% that I mentioned for the OECD countries. 70% food and energy. The composite output PMI stood at 47.8 in November, so that gives you an indication as well of the activity. That's uncertainty number one. Uncertainty number two uh, is about how these shocks will actually affect supply and demand over the medium term, which makes it harder for us to judge medium term inflation pressures. So when you look back, you have a succession of what others have called the polycrisis, pandemic, Russian, horrible Russian invasion of Ukraine, that have accelerated pre-existing geopolitical major developments that I would call geopolitical shifts, which meant, continuous, which meant that continuously expanding supply, notably of labor, notably of energy, is no longer guaranteed. So these principles on which we had grown um, very comfortably in many corners of the world, based on the availability of labor, availability of energy, uh, is no longer uh, the case and probably for uh, years to come. Three transformation are in play from our perspective in Europe. The first one is the role of China as an exporter of low labor cost. That is in question from our perspective. Second, European diversification of energy mix could mean higher energy prices for a while. And third, the acceleration of green transition could lower fossil fuel investment. All those three phenomena have a direct impact on uh, price pressures and inflation. At the same time, these changes will also have an impact on demand, but the extent and the magnitude will only become clear in time. First phenomenon, less ability to rotate demand to external markets when domestic demand slumps. Second, higher energy prices could lead to investment shifting outside the euro area. The discussion that was just had yesterday between President Macron and President Biden might be giving us a little sign of hope, but clearly the Inflation um, Reduction Act is a case in point of an incentive for companies to look elsewhere where energy costs are going to be cheaper and where incentives are also going to be made available. Third consequence as well, writing off of carbon intensive capital during the green transition. And I come to my third uncertainty, which leads me into my two interactions, which clearly have an impact on this shifting grounds and how we deal with inflation. The first interaction is the interaction between us central banks where clearly we are not only seeing, as uh, you, you said, Augustine, global inflation, but we're also seeing, with the exception of two countries uh, in particular, coordinated policy tightening by major central banks around the world that will certainly have spillovers and spillbacks, but with different effects and different time horizon. The US policy tightening, in particular, is found to affect industrial production as much in the euro area as in the US, and to lower euro area inflation over the medium term. That's for the medium term. But in the short term, in so far as it leads to appreciation of the dollar and a stronger dollar as a result, it can raise commodity import prices and increase inflation. And remember, commodity prices, in particular energy, generally uh, transacted and denominated in US dollars is 70% of the inflation that we have. Second interaction, so that's the interaction between central banks. The second interaction is the one between central banks and their monetary policies and governments with their fiscal policies. 
In the short run, in Europe, what we are hoping for, us central bankers, is fiscal policies that would be based on what we call the triple T's, temporary, targeted, and tailored. Because those triple T policies can actually help uh, alleviate the effect of the energy shocks and put a cap on inflation expectations. That would be the good, the good case scenario. But fiscal policies that create excess demand in a supply-constrained economy might force monetary policy to tighten more than would otherwise be necessary. And regrettably, at the moment at least, some of the fiscal measures that we are analyzing from many of the European and particularly Euro area governments are pointing in the direction of the latter category rather than the former. And how fiscal policy ultimately consolidates, that is, whether it cuts investment as it did right after the uh, global financial crisis, will also be key as to whether supply constraints persist in the future. Now, given this exceptional uncertainty, I couldn't agree more with Augustine that what we central bankers have to do is to actually deliver a monetary policy that anchors expectations so that those expectations remain moored to the target while the various forces that I have mentioned before continue playing out. So to do so, we need to signal to the public, to the observers, to the commentators, that in all scenarios, inflation will return to our medium-term target in a timely manner. This is the best that we can do in the current environment. We can also raise our voice and explain how fiscal policy could actually either help or hinder. Um, and we can certainly use all the communication tools that are available in order to uh, do so as best as we can. If we didn't do that, then certainly it would lead to large welfare losses for the population. The euro area cannot avoid the terms of trade loss that we are facing, which amounted to, in the second quarter of 22, to 2% of GDP. But if expectations on the top of that were to de-anchor, we would also end up with permanently higher inflation as the current shocks would become embedded and as a result, we would have to harden even more our monetary policy adjustments. So this in turn implies that to achieve sustainable and balanced growth, coming back to growth now, it's not just going to be monetary policy. It's going to be for other policies to also act in concert. And it has to be different from what we saw over, last, over the last decade. Public investment after the global financial crisis was a main casualty in Europe. And at the time, the structural reforms that were so much needed and advocated were not really put in place either. So, Euro area government at that time invested around 500 billion less in the period from 2011 to 2019 as compared with the period 2000 to 2009. And after the great financial crisis, the European Commission revised down potential output by between 8 to 10% after 10 years compared with the path that it expected before the crisis. These are the errors, if I may say, uh, that we must absolutely avoid this time around. We need higher investment and structural reforms to remove the supply constraints and ensure that potential output is not impaired by the changing global economy. And that's a big question and an uncertainty that we have. This will be particularly important in the energy sector and in the strategic supply chains. And in a world where external demand is more uncertain, we will also need to strengthen domestic supply and demand through higher productivity growth. This will be particularly true in digitalization. And if you just consider that only around half of EU firms innovated or adopted new technologies in 2021 compared with close to two thirds in the United States, quite a lot of ground has to be covered. But it can be covered with the right policy mix and with actors working together 
in a slightly different fashion than what they did after the global financial crisis. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Christine. Very, as usual, very well structured your commentary. In particular, I like very much this 3 two, one <laughs> formula. Uh, very clear. Now let me give the floor to, to Phil, though. Please, Phil, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Augustine, and I'd like to extend my uh, congratulations to my many friends at the Bank of Thailand for reaching um, 80 years. It's a, it's a fantastic achievement. What I'd like to do is to briefly talk about the situation in Australia and then to uh, continue the reflection on the change of global inflation dynamics. Uh, the inflation situation in Australia is very similar to um, that in most of the other advanced economies. Inflation is 7% at the moment. It's expected to go a bit higher, but then to start coming down next year, and we think it'll take a couple of years to get back to the target range. Inflation expectations are still very well anchored. Wage growth has picked up, but at the moment, it's not at a rate that's inconsistent with inflation returning to target, which is good news. Our real economy has performed really well. We've bounced back strongly from the lockdowns of last year, and the level of output now is significantly above where it was before the pandemic. The unemployment rate is as low as it's been since 1974. So we've had the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. Labor force participation has been very strong. The employment to population ratio has never been higher than it is now. Labor market's tight and the borders are open and immigration has started again and the rate of population growth has returned to where it was before the pandemic. So the labor market is doing uh, very well. National income is also pretty strong. We're on the other side of the European terms of trade. Um, hit our terms of trade are the highest they've been in 150 years. So national income is strong, the labour market's strong and the economy has bounced back and domestic spending so far has been resilient in the face of higher interest rates. Partly that's because of all the saving that was done over the past couple of years when people couldn't spend and the lockdowns were in place. So to date the real economy has been uh, very strong. In terms of monetary policy, we've lifted interest rates by two and three quarter percent since May. By my count, we were the first central bank to step back to what's considered normal interest rate increases. We moved to um, 25 basis points in October. We did that after having made four moves of 50 basis points. That decision was, was really uh, grounded in the recognition that we've already made a large cumulative increase in interest rates. And there are lags in the implementation or the effects of monetary policy on the economy. I think it's quite possible that the lags will be longer um, this time, partly because of all the savings that people did in the last couple of years. We also recognise that uh, there was a, you know, a combination of a weakening global economy, everyone raising interest rates, real incomes are declining, housing prices are declining, and households will be making a record share of um, their disposable income in interest payments next year. So you put all that together, a weakening global economy, declining real incomes, declining housing prices and record interest payments, and everyone raising interest rates. And it's quite plausible that, that sees um, spending in the economy slow next year, and as the supply side problems get resolved, slower spending, better supply side inflation um, could come back down, and we recognise there are lags in the operation of monetary policy. We're still trying to tread that narrow path of bringing inflation back down without the economy slowing too much and losing all those hard-won gains in the labour market that it's taken us really decades to achieve. I think it's still possible, at least for us, to tread that narrow path, but uh, it's going to be pretty easy to be knocked off it. Uh, and our priority will be to um, get inflation uh, back to target over the next couple of years. So that's the situation in Australia. I just would like to continue the um, discussion we've been having about changing global inflation dynamics. For the past 25 years, we largely thought of our job of um, moving interest rates around to control aggregate demand. If inflation was too low, we'd lower interest rates to stimulate mm. spending, get inflation back to target, and, and revive the reverse if inflation was too high. The supply side was benign and was actually mostly helpful, as um, Christine um, said. We became very used to very little variation in inflation. It was in kind of in a very narrow range all the time, and we became extraordinarily focused on whether inflation was a quarter or maybe even a half a percent away from our targets. 
I think we became overly focused on that issue. We talked about the great moderation. Inflation was varying within a one or one and a half percentage point range. And for a while there we were worried that inflation was too low. And it was half or a quarter percent above where we uh, wanted it to be. I think we'll look back on this period as kind of an extraordinary period, not, not boring, as uh, Mervyn King uh, said, but it'll feel boring relative to what comes um, next, I feel. Looking forward, the supply side is going to be much more challenging as we've already talked about. I think we're going to have to deal with a lot more variation in inflation from year to year than we've had for the last 30 years. We've already covered some of the, the reasons for that, but uh, I've got four on my list. The first is uh, deglobalisation. The second is the changing demographics, the declining populations in many of our countries and the ageing of the populations. Climate change. Surely we're going to have more extreme weather events which are going to disrupt the supply sides of our economy and lead to uh, more variability in prices. And the fourth is the energy transition. There's a lot of investment going in renewables as there should be, but the existing capital stock producing energy is depreciating very, very quickly. Either if uh, it's being decommissioned or firms are not um, uh, engaging in a lot of maintenance because the, they know that eventually these plants will have to be showed down, shut down. So I think we're going to see uh, more frequent examples of where demand is running up against the ability of the global system to produce power and electricity. And that's going to lead to more price spikes, not just in electricity, but it'll uh, have ramifications right through the production change. So deglobalisation, demographics, climate change and the energy transition all mean inflation is going to be more variable. And I think we'll look back on the last 30 years as a bit boring. If inflation is going to be more variable, it makes the credibility of the monetary policy regime more important than ever. We really want people to believe and understand that when inflation moves away from target, and we, that's going to happen more often, that it will come back. If they don't believe that, then deviations of inflation from target will be more persistent and it'll be harder uh, to get it to come back. I think that's it. In my mind, this is another reason why at this particular juncture, it's really important that we get inflation back to target. This is the first test in the current, I think, in the new world where inflation is going to be more variable. That's the first test. We've, inflation's moved out of the range that it's been in for 30 years, and we need to demonstrate to the public that inflation will come back down. If we don't pass this first test, then the next tests are going to be even harder. So if you think about this in a longer term perspective, we've got to be able to demonstrate to the public that when inflation moves away from target, comes back. So it's really important that we pass this test or the next ones are going to be even harder. Thank you. I'm um, sorry I can't be more cheery. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Phil. Very, very interesting. Uh, now uh, let's go come back to Asia and uh, Perry, the floor is yours. Thank you. The, uh, thank you, Augustine. And let me start by congratulating uh, Bank of Thailand, Governor Stafford, and all my friends in uh, Bank of Thailand. 80 years, always the great years, and of course, wishing all the best for the next years. Well, of course, uh, just on the topic of today, how the global spillover to every country is, of course, this is still sleepless night of the central bank, especially us. But that will also depend on especially two things, how the impact of the global spillover to region as well as a country. Mm. One, the state of the economic development of the country. Of course, Christine already mentioned, US, Europe, both the inflation dynamic is coming not only from the supply, also the demand side. Mm intertwining between the two, the actually the dynamic, more shiver there. But in other countries, in Asia, we just recover. Indonesia, for example, we are still on the territory approaching of zero output gap. So our inflation is still more on the supply side. Cost, food, energy, global 
price, uh, uh, food rather than demand. Then I think many country, emerging country, also facing the same thing. One, in emerging country, Indonesia, including, that our inflation more supply driven rather than intertwining with the demand driven. Second, Christine right, how the policy respond? Especially not only from the central bank credibility, but also the coordination between fiscal and monetary policy. Because to address the inflation from the supply must coming from fiscal. The demand is coming from monetary. This is also very important. And Indonesia also fortunate that we have very close coordination between the two, the fiscal monetary policy. Let me just go into detail. We are grateful our inflation is coming down. Uh, four months ago is 6.9 to 5.9, now is 5.4 percent CPI inflation. Our core inflation is very muted. 3.3 percent last month, this month is about 3.1 percent. We have a target 3 percent plus minus one. So this is showing that more on the supply side driven inflation rather than the output gap demand side driven. Our economic growth quite positive, 5.7% last quarter, the third quarter, both from the export and domestic consumption. This year we are expecting 5.2%. Next year will be about 5% both from the export and domestic demand consumption keep rising. So I think we are grateful that Indonesia is one of the best performer with very low inflation. On the inflation, we are aiming, our inflation we will bring down to our targeted level on the first semester next year, and the CPI inflation the second semester uh, next year. This is the, the dynamic. This this uh, what we are expecting. So mm. when we are facing only in the supply side, then we have to be careful how to address. It is uh, more on the supply side, then actually our inflation is still about muted and economic growth good. Second, on the policy. We have very close coordination between government. I'm independent, we are independent, but we are I'm talking very frequently with my president, my dear friend, Minister Sri Mulyani. We are always discussing how best we coordinate with our respective independent to uh, steer the country economic from the global civil Three policies that we are coordinating. One, on the fiscal. Uh, this is the last year, three years, we are under emergency law of the COVID whereby the fiscal deficit of Indonesia can succeed 3%. This year is 3.8%. But starting next year, fiscal deficit will be come back to below 3%. This is under mm. the law. Under the emergency law for the, uh, this last three years, this is the last year, central bank can also participate in direct financing through government bond purchase for only for the social program as well as for humanity, purchasing vaccine, health, and so on, not for the general funding. So when we are seeing the global spillover from the, the war in Ukraine and others, high commodity price, energy price, we discuss, one, the fiscal giving more subsidy, with some part of the financing of the central bank. And we are debating what the best delivering the subsidy. Whether, I think the treaty is very important, what you're talking, Christine. Fiscal subsidy, whether for the social program or some part of the price subsidy. Under the normal time, the best is more direct transfer. Don't go to the price subsidy. But we are, when we are facing this is high commodity price and energy price from 
the global. Then we allocate more on the price subsidy and some part of them from the social program. Thereby, with giving subsidy to the price subsidy, our inflation relative muted. Mm. This is this is what what we have. Some part, of course, for direct transfer from the social program. Because the two of them will have direct impact on the consumption. If we allocate all of them to direct transfer, inflation will be very high. Consumption will be also being driven down. And, of course, the policy response of the central bank will be more safer. So we are grateful to have coordination there. More subsidy, price subsidy, as well as the social program. That's why we are having inflation very uh, low. Second, on the, uh, on the monetary policy, of course, we are quite uh, responsive. We are front-loaded, preemptive, forward-looking. Over the past uh, four months, we already increased 175 basis points from 3.5 percent. Now it's 5.25 percent. I'm waiting for Bill to do your policy and also the Fed fund rate, how it's actually do. This is a uh, preemptive for looking and front loaded interest response is very important to bring down, to mitigate the inflation expectation. How inflation expectations come coming down very uh, rapidly. Close to 7% four months ago, 6.9%. But now already approaching to 5.5 percent, approaching to our forecast. So the gap we are measuring between consensus forecast and our forecast, internal process. Now is the 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 difference is closing. Uh, four months ago is very high. We are forecasting back then 6.1 percent, but it, consensus forecast is 6.9 percent. But after we are uh, aggressively uh, responding to interest, then the gap between consensus forecast and our forecast is narrowing. Mm. It's almost the same. Second on the monetary policy, this is probably we always debate with Bill and Christine on the exchange rate. For emerging country, including Indonesia, exchange rate policy is a matter. Because when we are facing high energy price, at the same time, very strong dollar. Dollar year to year, probably appreciating by close to 25%. The dollar index was 114, now it's already declining. Our choice, whether we want to depreciate also with 25%, or we have to narrow those depreciation. This is the choice. So we decided to narrow, to lower the depreciation, which is actually our aim is to address the imported inflation. Mm. The nominal exchange rate pass-through is very small, about 8 to 11 basis point for you know, 1% uh, uh, nominal depreciation to inflation. But when we are facing with 90 you know, dollar energy prices, oil prices, those nominal term to domestic inflation is very high. So this is why, uh, why we all do uh, intervention in our exchange rate policy, of course, to reduce the volatility, but also to mitigate the imported inflation. That's the reason why our inflation relatively low. First, fiscal subsidy. Second, aggressive interest rate response combined with exchange rate stabilization for imported inflation. And lastly, this is particular, probably not being happening in Australia, Europe, uh, but many happening in emerging country, including Indonesia, when we are facing 16 million island, mm. the food price. Food price in Indonesia consists of 20% of CPI. Mm -hmm. When there is high commodity price, global uh, energy and food price, the supply and distribution 
and nationally it's become disruptive. The third policy that we introduce uh, under President Joko Widodo direction to the local government and Sri Mulyani also giving incentive to local government, the national movement to fight the food inflation. And both Bank Indonesia and Minister Fine going there to persuade and to uh, coordinate with local government. We have competition. Whoever the local government can beat uh, the food price, then we are giving award. About four months ago, the food price about 10.3%. You can meet where 10.3 times 20% of the CPI is a food price. How much is contribution of the food price to CPI? Plan? But now, our food price coming down rapidly to 5.4%. This is actually direct, uh, you know, uh, intervention for our supply and distribution uh, of production in when you are facing divergency in domestic supply chain is very important and this is very effective. And we are also joining our government and we through our 46 branches. Because we have choice. If we do not do that, 25, 20% times 10% of food inflation, how much CPI inflation, how much inflation expected, how much we, we have to raise interest rate. It's more you know, costly when we intervene the supply side driven inflation through interest rate. So I think that's actually uh, what we have. One, we have to mindful where is the state of the economy. Where does the dynamic of the inflation and growth coming from the supply only or also intertwined with the demand. Second, that's determine the response whether only from monetary policy, if this is demand, but in, our, in many cases of the country, every world, there's also supply side. The fiscal is very important. The fiscal, the treaty of Christine mentioned, mm. I think we may debate, but normal time, prices with this bad is wrong, but in this time situation, it's needed. Otherwise, our inflation is very high, interest rate reform is very also uh, you know, very hard. And of course, monetary policy, the standard that we know, credibility, quick uh, uh, interest rate response for emerging market, of course, you know, uh, intervention, stabilization of exchange rate. Lastly, to be innovative in emerging country, I don't know in South Africa, less, uh, but in our Indonesia, direct intervention of the food price mm -hmm. matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Perry. And now, last but not least, uh, let me give the floor to Raghu Rajan, a very good friend of all of us, ex-Central Bank Governor of Reserve Bank of India, great professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, so, Raghu, Raghu uh, the floor is yours. Great to have you here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Augustine, and sorry to be like big brother watching all over you. Uh, up here. Uh, thanks to the Bank of Thailand and the BIS and uh, congratulations to the Bank of Thailand on your 80th birthday. Let me wish you a long and independent life. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I don't uh, uh, have a central bank uh, to run. Uh, so let me take the independence I get to ask a a question, which is, you know, why do we have this great inflation, and to what extent is monetary policy uh, to to uh, blame for it? It's too early to uh, uh, to levy blame, but uh, the reason I'm I'm saying this is really to think about how we uh, sort of set policies uh, for the future. Uh, including in this fight against inflation. And uh, let, me, let me just uh, explain what I mean. Uh, clearly, we've had various unexpected shocks, the pandemic, and as, as well as the supply response to the pandemic, uh, the war, and uh, the tremendous uh, fiscal response in many industrial countries. But still, there is a question that can be asked, which is, was monetary policy too accommodative for too long, given the enormous uh, sort of uh, fiscal 
uh, as well as supply chain effects that were emerging. And as a result, have we been uh, forced to raise interest rates uh, overly rapidly in order to catch up with uh, attendant stresses on the economy. It would have been nicer if we had started earlier with longer time to observe the actions and perhaps that would have shielded us from the possibility of, uh, of mistakes down the line of being perhaps a little too um, uh, contractionary eventually. Um, and I want to point to, uh, you know, uh, what the BIS said in its annual report, which I thought was very, very uh, thoughtful and insightful, when it described uh, really two inflation regimes, a low inflation regime and a high inflation regime. That uh, suffices for what I'm going to say. Uh, in the low inflation regime, uh, sort of shocks are essentially absorbed. They don't precipitate. Uh, correlated moves in uh, in prices elsewhere, and you uh, you get uh, you get higher inflation. E effectively, nothing disturbs the re regime, and that looks like what we had uh, between the global financial crisis and the pandemic. And then you have the high inflation regime, which was what was before the global financial crisis, and what we have now, where uh, every every sort of disruption seems to feed on everything else and we get, uh, we get uh, significant price reactions to everything. And, and uh, to some extent, uh, the question is, uh, were our frameworks and policies that we had before the pandemic and that we then adapted uh, to the low inflation regime, uh, did we go too far? Or were the policies uh, sort of uh, nimble enough? Uh, were the frameworks nimble enough when the regime shifted on us, uh, perhaps due to no fault of the central banks, but because the external en environment, the pandemic, the, the fiscal authorities uh, uh, changed the regime uh, for the central banks from the low to the high. Um, and then the question then comes, you know, how do we set policies uh, going forward? How do we set frameworks going forward that allow us uh, to not get locked in to a particular regime uh, as and when uh, the regime changes. Uh, of course, you may say this is not a big deal because we're not going to see so many regime changes. But the costs of having the wrong policies or the wrong frameworks when the regime changes can be, can be substantial. And, and, and I take what uh, Governor Lowe said about the uh, likelihood that we will have uh, somewhat volatile inflation going forward. But of course, volatility can also take us back to a, uh, a lower inflation regime. But certainly, volatility in growth can take us back. I mean, if you think about all the headwinds to growth uh, that face us now with aging, with uh, lower immigration and, and opposition to immigration, with uh, fiscal room having diminished significantly across the globe, with deglobalization, with China slowing and no longer providing that engine of growth which the world had come to rely on, and with many emerging markets facing K-shaped recoveries, yes, there are uh, silver linings in the cloud. Maybe the green investment, the green uh, revolution will help us uh, revive investment and growth. Maybe digitization will help us, but we should be prepared to potentially go back to the low inflation regime. So are the policies we adopt now uh, going to be compatible with that? And more important, uh, what have we learned from the previous low inflation regime? What policies should be willing to follow uh, in that regime to get us back to growth? What is uh, reasonable? What is too much? I think we will learn a lot over the next few years and it would be good to keep in mind uh, sort of how we, how we change the nature of central banking as we go along, what should we do and what shouldn't we do. Let me stop there and uh, uh, no. over back to you. <laughs> That's when we want the answer. Come on. <laughs> questions. Agu, you have to give us the answers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, at the end, central banking is an art, not a science. <laughs> so we have to become a little bit of 
artists and, and uh, have our imagination work for us. Now, let me, let me get the discussion going. I will ask a question directed to each, to each of the panelists, but I, I, I invite the other panelists to pitch in, in the answer or, or generate a little bit of a debate. Uh, and then we can open the floor for, for the, the audience to also uh, express their views or ask questions. So let me, let me start uh, with you, Christine. Um, in you, your very interesting uh, commentary, uh, you mentioned uh, the exchange rate as an aspect to be watched, in particular because it affects uh, imported, imported inflation. And this is something also that Perry uh, mentioned in his intervention. And I can say that, for example, in Latin America, a good motivation for early tightening was precisely to avoid the exchange rate channel as a process of affecting, affecting inflation. Uh, traditionally, advanced economies do not necessarily take that much attention, pay that much attention to the exchange rate. Uh, just because uh, they're, they're large economies and the external sector relatively is uh, not that big. But this seems to have changed. Uh, it probably has a little bit to do with the global nature of inflation. Uh, but uh, in any case, it would be interesting to hear from you, uh, Christine, if you can give us a little bit more of light on how, how the exchange rate uh, plays a role in your policy determination, and uh, you know how how are you focusing that aspect? Well, conventional wisdom will tell you that we do not target any exchange rate. Yes. Okay, uh, and that obviously we are monitoring, and that we are very attentive to variation of uh, exchange rates, and in particular, we are uh, monitoring carefully um, what has been an appreciation of the dollar. Uh, which, you know, over the last, despite the most recent um, depreciation relative to the euro, has been in the range of 12 to 13 percent in the last 12 months. But I would say that in terms of um, impact on inflation, it is probably less so the case in Europe and notably in the euro area, because about 60 percent of the trade. Um, of the euro area is actually trade amongst member states. And therefore, we are, as far as those 60, 65% immune to the variation and the appreciation of the dollar. Of course, a lot of the energy, uh, in particular oil, um, less so gas, but oil definitely uh, is, is transacted and, and in, in US dollars. And that has an impact uh, given the, uh, the importance that energy has had in inflation in the last uh, 12 months in particular. But it's probably more so the case in some of the emerging market economies, and probably Perry has, is more impacted yeah. uh, than, than us in the euro area. And I would say that it, it, there, there is more of an impact through the financial channel than through the expenditure yes. channel, yes. for sure. Absolutely. Perry? Well, this is actually the issue that all of us, the central bank, must thinking ahead, the energy. Because the problem of energy is not only about the economic production, but also the supply disruption. But the supply disruption is also from the politics, the tensions for geopolitics. Second, I think the problem, as Bill also mentioned, will be lingering for some time. But because the energy transition takes years. So we have to face that the problem of inflation and the ramification of the growth dynamic going forward from the energy. Then how we have to respond in that? Well, frankly, this is the challenging. As I said, Indonesia fortunate for the, the last year, this year we still have opportunity to have fiscal deficit, uh, subsidy, and, and so on. But going forward, then actually the room for fiscal space is becoming limited. The adjustment, the transmission of global energy price to domestic inflation becoming more 
uh, severe. Well, this is the balance between inflation and growth. First, we have to, to rethink whether we will be, uh, you know, disciplinedly targeting toward our medium term inflation to 2%. And what is the cost to growth? Come back to the Philip Cup again. The balance between inflation and growth nexus. We, if we can, we want to be two percent. Then the growth we have to stay, you know, to settle with a very low growth because inflation must be addressed to higher interest rate response. This is this is the choice, a hard choice. While waiting for the energy transition to replace the fossil to non-fossil climate green and so on, take years, take years. That's on the inflation and growth dynamic and how we have to respond both from the fiscal and monetary. Mm -hmm. Second, <laughs> on, the fisc uh, on the financial sector. This is also a challenging. Even now, I also frequently, Christine, being complained by my fellow bankers mm -hmm. and even my investment manager because they want and we also from the government central bank, we want to transition to energy. Developed country able to develop a good project, but emerging country like us, we have to still learn. Mm. Developing the green project is not easy. The requirement, the environment, and also the structure of the project. Once we do that, the structure of the financing, and then have to come to our bankers and investment bankers. Now they face with the investor. The info that demanding the transition cannot be five years. The transition of the energy for the financing must be now. So my fellow bankers and financial community have difficulties now to find the project at the same time and being pushed also from the investor cannot finance to non-green project. This is more on the balance sheet of the corporate balance sheet on the financial sector. This is where BIS Augustine, when we are talking about macro, monetary, macro financial policy framework, and the theory, the framework easy. When we are facing monetary, macro financial facing inflation dynamic, growth dynamic from the high energy price and take time to transit. At the same time, the financial stability issues pressing facing the problem now where the banking have difficulties to raise funding because the zero finance movement from the investor yeah. well mm -hmm. let's just uh, sleep tonight and for to tomorrow then <laughs> <laughs> very good very good very now let me move to to inflation variability and the shift between regimes an issue that was mentioned by Phil and Ragu. Phil, how, how do, you, do you think the addition variability or the enhanced variability inflation will affect precisely the, or should affect the monetary policy frameworks? Uh, I mean, in a way, the previous regimes uh, meant that we had variability of re relative prices, but those variability of re relative prices did not fit or did not pro provide inf information about future inflation. I think when you shift, shift from one regime to another is when people uh, are extracting information not from relative prices but from the variability of inflation itself. So analytically, how do you think we should focus on this issue? And, uh, and uh, yes, uh, uh, Ragu, I think uh, I would also invite your thoughts on this issue. Yeah, well, that's a tough question, and I'm not sure I've got the answer. But um, what I do know is that even if the world has got more supply shocks, it doesn't reduce the need for us to focus on inflation as our core objective. So we, we've got to keep in mind that our main job is price stability. I think over the last 30 years, we got trapped in a world where we thought price stability should be defined in a particular way, but inflation gets kept in a, in a very narrow range. We're not 
I think it's unlikely we're going to be able to do that in the future. Inflation's going to move around a lot more, isn't it? And uh, that doesn't mean that we can't hit our inflation objectives. I think we can still do it, but um, we've got to be able to demonstrate to the public that when it does move away, it comes back. And this is why I think in the current episode, it's so important we're able to do that. Um, it's going to be harder for the private sector to work out what shifts in the general level of prices and what's relative and price shifts. So that's going to make it harder for resource planning. But our job will be to make sure that this variability, always we always return to the target and then inflation averages two or two and a half percent in our case. We'll just live with more variability. And we, we've got a job of explaining that to the public. And I think also um, explaining that um, we've lived through a, um, a period where we were able to contain inflation in our range, but we're probably not going to be able to do that in the future. And so there's an education well to go on as well for us. And uh, the other thing that I think Christine touched on this is if there are more supply side shocks, the best response to that is flexibility on the supply side, to addressing the supply side so that when these shocks come that um, uh, things can be, uh, adjustments can occur relatively quickly. We can't, as central banks, do very much about that, but the political and business class can. So I don't know how it changes the analytical framework, but it, I know it doesn't change our basic job of delivering a low um, rate of inflation that averages two point something. Let me, let me push a little bit more and then I'll give the floor to, to Rago. I mean, and let's go back, uh, let's say, 18 months. In 18 months ago, we were trapped uh, a little bit in this debate between, uh, you know, I mean, uh, our framework, part of our framework says that if we are looking into a, even a sequence of relative price changes, that doesn't necessarily mean a, a generalized increase in, in, in all prices. And sort of the doctrine in central banking would say, uh, let's just uh, uh, look through it, you know. Uh, so in a way, we, we sort of had a, 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 an initial reaction or our reaction function in a, in, in, in a, in a first instance was, let's wait and see, yeah. you know. But then you know, I guess relative price changes were combined with aggregate demand shocks and it become regeneralized. Now, do you think that this should make us to be a little bit less patient about how to digest or uh, internalize relative price changes? Do you think the problem is how to identify relative price changes? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it might be that we are invited to have a more proactive monetary policy. No, not necessarily, because we've just come through a, a truly unique period. We had all a sequence of supply shocks, it just wasn't one, it was a sequence. And the starting point was interest rates at a record low level. In most of our countries, interest rates were zero, which is incredibly unusual. It's unusual to have a sequence of supply shocks. And I think the other dynamic, and this partly goes to Raghu's question about where we got the inflation from, We've talked a lot about the supply side, but there was a huge amount of demand stimulus. Mm. Yeah. I know um, in Australia we had a very much an insurance mindset. Mm. The, the, the pandemic was so dire, the economic consequences of that were, were truly catastrophic, we thought, and that there would be deep and protracted scarring in the economy, perhaps for years. And uh, with monetary policy and with fiscal policy, we wanted to provide maximum insurance to the society against the truly worst possible outcome. And it turned out we didn't get the worst possible outcome. Mm. And we got a vaccine, people got vaccinated, and we bounced back fairly quickly. So we didn't need the full insurance policy. But the full insurance policy uh, imparted a lot of stimulus into the economy at a time when interest rates were zero and we had a sequence of supply shocks. So it's a, a truly unique period. I think going forward, uh, we will hopefully be able to return to a world where we can look through supply shocks, provided um, uh, that the public is convinced that inflation will come back to target when we get hit away. 
This is why I think the current episode is so important to demonstrate that we will do that. If we can do that, then as long as we don't get hit by a sequence of supply shocks in the future, possible, but if we don't, then we'll be able to look through and go back to the textbook. Inflation goes up for a while, but then it comes back painlessly. But we've got to show that we can bring it back now to make that happen. Absolutely. Mm. Raghu, your thoughts? Well, let me try a different tack, which is uh, why were we so willing to label these relative price movements and not recognize that it was perhaps a little more than that? And, and part of it may well be that um, you know, our, our instruments, right? Remember, uh, the whole idea behind quantitative easing working was that uh, one of the elements was, uh, we're not going to raise interest rates until we end quantitative easing. And then we will be willing to raise interest rates, right? And, and the whole point about quantitative easing working as an instrument was, you know, we're going to give you a line of sight about how long this is going to endure and so you should be confident we're not going to raise interest rates until it ends. And, and we're going to be very, very open about when that is going to happen. So uh, in a sense, it was an instrument for the wrong regime. Uh, it was an instrument for a low inflation regime when you wanted to build credibility that you will not raise interest rates uh, you know, hastily. You will be, as Paul Krugman once put it, uh, rationally or uh, credibly responsible uh, because you don't want to hurry to attack inflation. Uh, that's the way you get inflation up. And the whole problem was we had too low inflation. Now, it, uh, you know, arguably, that was what also constrained us, whether it was, uh, you know, we didn't recognize those, 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 uh, the inflation building, but also whether we were actually waiting for our instruments to play out, wanting to preserve them for the next time we had low inflation. If we broke the credibility this time by acting too, uh, too quickly, then perhaps the instrument would not be available the next time we had low inflation. Um, how much did that play a role? And then it raises the more important question, if we are going to a more variable regime, is this the kind of instrument we should have or should we put it in the closet and bring it down only in, 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 when we are deeply in trouble? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, that's, that's what I was in a sense referring to in, in, in going back and examining, uh, you know, what constrained us. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I want also to <clears throat> I want to echo what uh, Philip was saying because it, it, there was something so specific about what we just uh, what we've just been through. When you look at how brutal, how rapid the energy shock was, mm. I mean, in and of itself, you should have probably doubted that it was transitory that we were going to see it through because of the brutality, because of the. The, the rapidity at which it, it overwhelmed all of us. But that's not enough. I think there was, on the top of it, yeah. the geopolitical changes, the shifts, the transformation that were in play that associated with it actually transformed that episode. You know, if you compare it with the, the, uh, the oil crisis after the Iraq war, it didn't last long. It was about six months and then prices came back. But if you look at what happened when, when OPEC formed and, and coalesced and concerted and, and the Iranian revolution, that, those were much longer developments because it was associated with not only the oil crisis, but also transformation that were going to restructure relationships. We had pretty much the same kind of situation now, which mm. maybe we had forgotten. Uh, but certainly for which we were not equipped for the reasons that, that mm. Raghu has just mentioned. Uh, and if you, if you combine that with something which to us is, is quite mysterious, which is the rapid pass through that we are seeing at the moment. Yeah. You know, between producers' prices to industrial prices, the speed at which is going through, not, not entirely because I don't think that we've seen the end of it, but, but the, the a large amount of pass through in such a short period of time is also something that yeah. is very unusual and, and uh, yeah. we were not yeah. used to. Excellent. It might have to do with supply chain <laughs> problems and, and so on, uh, which is, yeah. makes it a really complex uh, environment. Perry. Well, let's take a moment. Not only looking the problem on the monetary. We have in the game theoretic approach, we have 
to objective inflation, which is also coming from demand and supply, right? This is inflation and growth dynamic. There's two instruments. This is monetary interest rate and fiscal. We learn if supply side inflation, the dynamic must decrew from the fiscal, right? The demand is from the monetary. This is game theoretic approach, the dynamic that we are facing. And Christian just mentioned, the dynamic is very quick because mm -hmm. we are facing globally. So what is the solution? One choice, let's do the corner solution. Just whatever the inflation coming from, just bang with monetary policy. Forget about the fiscal, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we can tame the inflation of course very severely with high interest rate. The outcome will also very volatile, very up and down growth because the growth is just residual. This is the corner solution if we only address the two objectives, the dynamic inflation and growth only from monetary policy. This is one corner solution. Or we want to opt for the stuck, stuck about solution in the middle. This is probably more, ide more, uh, I, more ideal. When the country politic, of course, have a room for that, which is counter cyclical monetary policy that we do, interest rate for preempt the inflation expectation going forward to tame the inflation from the demand side, or, and of course, collaboration with the fiscal, which is also counter cyclical from the supply side of the inflation. I think Ragu and others, I think this Stuckerberg solution is, I think, more optimal rather than the corner solution, only relying on interest rate to address the dynamic. But coming back again, the political dimension of the global and its respective country will determine whether we are opting the corner solution with much more previous impact or more you know, optimal. Absolutely enough. And we have learned that at the end of the day, it's not always possible to have the coordination, but uh, it also, we have also learned that if there is no a fair amount of congruency between both policies, we can uh, end up with a terrible, terrible result. Yeah. Uh, so we have addressed many very interesting issues about central banking. We have a few minutes to see if any of you have a, a a question for any of the panelists. Um, yes, please. Uh, uh. Here the mic is coming. Thank you. Let me turn the tables uh, and ask a question to Rago. Uh, Raghu, when you were uh, the governor of the Reserve Bank of India, uh, you wrote uh, a bit on the implications of advanced economy monetary policies, advanced economy central banks monetary policies for emerging markets. That was a different era. Uh, actually, the challenge was appreciation of currencies in emerging markets. Mm. Now, of course, we have this uh, highly synchronized uh, contractionary policies that challenges depreciation. So the, when you think about what happened at that time and what's going on now, how, um, you know, your recommendation to advanced economy central banks uh, has evolved or it is the, still the same advice or you think that uh, there is space uh, for coordination or thinking uh, deeper about coordination given that uh, these policies are often synchronize in one direction or another direction? Yeah. Let, let me collect one more question and then I'll, I'll offer the floor to, to the panel. Uh, set up, please. Yeah, question for Philip. Um, if you take the stuff that you've been uh, referring to and some of the other panelists have talked about, one, probably greater variability in inflation, two, maybe greater relative price shocks, three, maybe sometimes a need if it's coming from the supply side to look through inflation. Does that add up to uh, a situation where we should think about widening the bands of our inflation targeting framework? 
<laughs> any, any, any other question? Let me, let me add one last question for Christine. Christine, you are, for my knowing you for so many years, you are a master in communication. So how have you dealt with uh, your challenges as central bank <laughs> government? <laughs> I mean, uh, what, 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 given your past experience, what is so, so, what is so unique, or what, what advice do you have for central banks in the communications field, <laughs> having the, the advantage of both coming from the outside, but now being in the inside? <laughs> so let me start first with Ragu, and then go with Phil, and then. Well, I, I was going to add a question for Christine, which is uh, <laughs> following on Augustine, which is, uh, you know, Christine at the IMF was fantastic in coining, uh, you know, very brief terms, fully describing the regime we were in. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember s s globalization, mm -hmm. uh, lowflation. I mean, these are all uh, terms. Of what what would you uh, characterize the current regime? by uh, what we're going through right now. Uh, but uh, to, the, uh, to the broader question, uh, you know, uh, I think emerging market central banks have done a wonderful job this time in anticipating uh, the necessity for a rise in interest rates. Many of them have been moving for some time, Brazil and Mexico. Uh, and uh, to some extent, uh, you know, people keep asking where, where is it breaking in emerging markets? And of course, Many uh, are under some stress, but given the rapidity of interest rate rises in industrial countries, uh, it is uh, quite uh, remarkable that so far uh, some of the stress has been well borne by the emerging markets. And I think that's because they, you know, we've learned the lessons over time. We sort of know what to expect. We did understand there would be a uh, a, a transformation in capital flows, and uh, and uh, many of the emerging markets anticipated that. So I I, I, I sort of think, um, you know, where we were, it is hard to expect a coordinated strategy. Every uh, reserve country, central bank, has to do what it has to do to get inflation under control. It would be good if it was a slower pace, but given where they are, that's the pace they think most appropriate. And to some extent, the emerging markets have to adopt policies which, which are reactive to that. Uh, in this case, uh, they, they forecast what was going to happen and reacted well in advance, and I think it has served them well. Thank you very much. Raghu, Phil. Thank you. The question was, should we be thinking about um, widening bands? And <laughs> I mean, that would be one possibility, but that wouldn't be um, the way that I'd inclined to go. because. I think what we've got to do is to keep the focus on the medium term outcomes and that mm. we're going to deliver yes. an average inflation rate of two or two and a half percent over time. So I think if we say, well, we're always going to keep it within some range, we're, you know, in this more volatile world, we're going to have repeated instances of failure. But we should be able to deliver for our communities an average inflation rate of two or X or whatever it is that we choose and just accept that there'll be variation. Uh, the specification of the inflation target we have in Australia is, on average over time, mm. will deliver an inflation rate of mm. two point something. <laughs> I, you know, some people in the past have criticised and said, what does on average, what does oh, over whatever. time, what does two point something <laughs> mean? And so kind of, we kind of get, you can get trapped into this wall, but in the end, we want to deliver an average rate of inflation of two and a bit and convince people that that's what we're doing. We've really done that, and when we're away from that, we'll come back to it. So I don't, I don't like the idea that we're going to kind of focus on the boundaries. Yeah. I think the focus of the communication needs to be on the average, and we always come back to the average when we're away. Mm. So, Christine? Well, communication-wise, we, we certainly <laughs> we have adopted a different approach, and our strategy review was deliberate in avoiding the close to but below and was, you know, targeting specifically yes. two in the medium term and symmetric. Uh, to your point, Augustine, it, one, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm not, you know, the ultimate communicator. Yes, um, <laughs> but, but what I find particularly uh, challenging with the kind of communication that we have to use, and which is one of the key tools 
uh, that um, can, can be exploited is that it leads you to being very schizophrenic. <laughs> because you have to, you, you address a particular audience which is attentive to every single word, comma, inflection of voice, movement of your eyebrows, uh, <laughs> different uh, calibration of association of words. And then you have the other audience that doesn't understand anything that you have said to the first audience. Yeah. Yeah. And yet that second audience <laughs> has to be convinced as well because inflation expectations, of course, are the products of all these wonderful mm. forecasters, surveys, and professional da da da. But it's also going to be the consumer's expectations that will drive the show. And it, it, it leads you to having to try to avoid inconsistencies between those two languages that don't talk to each other and those categories of audiences that ignore each other, and probably rightly so. <laughs> yeah. Very well to, to Raghu, I, I, I'm going to think about it, but <laughs> I would say uh, over to two by all accounts. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Well, uh, colleagues, thank you, thank you very much for this uh, very lively debate, very interesting uh, positions. I think it has illustrated very well the nature of our huge challenge of dealing with uh, an ever-changing dynamics of inflation and, and growth. So please uh, join me in giving a hand to our panelists. Uh, well done. Thank you.